October 9th back to order. Mike, could you leave us in the pledge? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, welcome everyone. Before we get uh, started with the evening's meeting, I'd like to just take a quick moment to talk about something that's threatening communities all across our country, and that is this opioid epidemic. Um, Dublin, as everyone knows, is not immune to this crisis, and we understand that like all cities, it's, an on, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's going to take everyone working together to bring, back, bring about change and implement solutions. And to that end, our, our police department and, and um, Hines and his guys have been working tirelessly to come up with innovative solutions to this problem. And as in this position, I have the opportunity to attend a lot of these different meetings and forums and discussions and things. And as I've sat through these conversations, it has occurred to me that I sort of sit there and I look around at these experts, the counselors and the law enforcement and, and the, the families who've been impacted, and they all have something important to say. And it occurred to me, what am I doing here? What, what, what can I add to this situation? And I've struggled with that because I think I need to try to give back something. And it led me to finally realize that one of the most important things that we as a community can do is, and it sounds like such a small thing, but it has such an enormous impact. And I have an example, and it's my personal example that I'll share with you. And it is the simple fact or the act of going and getting off the couch and going and looking in your own medicine cabinet about what is in your medicine cabinet. And so after months and months and months going to these meetings and listening to this and knowing that this is something that I should do, I never did it. Well, I finally did. And here are my five full pill bottles of pain medication. There's one in here that my wife had from 2003 uh, that is about 55 pills of something called tramadol and it says to take four times a day for pain and these pills are all in my medicine cabinet I've been sitting here listening to the, this poison killing our community and I never bothered to go look until recently and and so that is um, at least in my mind I thought if I can try to reach other people like me if we can get to people, if we can penetrate the brain and get to people to think about this and actually go do something about it. I have two teenage kids. There are teenagers in and out of my house all day, every day. It's like Grand Central Station. I don't know who has access to my medicine cabinet. I don't know the people that are in and out of my house. I can't keep track of all of that, and I'm not always at home, of course. So that is one small example of what we need to do. And so. This staff, and, and Dana has, has his staff completely committed to coming up with solutions to this problem. And so the staff has launched this concept that's going to be referred to as Take Back Tuesday. And there's going to be two of them. The first one's going to be on October the 17th at Caltenback Park on Cara Road, which is on our south end, right, Dana? That's the, the park that came from the township. Cara um, Road. Um, at 7.30 p.m., and then the second one will be Tuesday, October the 24th, one week later, from 6 to 7.30 at Scioto Park. And, Chief, I'll have you comment, if you'd be willing, um, about what exactly will happen when we get there and what people can expect. Well, thank you, Mayor. I just, I just want to comment that, you know, thank you for your leadership in initiating these events. We think it's a great idea. Um, I want people to realize that um, d despite the fact that we're doing these Take Back Tuesdays, Everybody has the opportunity to drop off prescription medication at our police department 24-7, 365. We have a drop-off box in our lobby. You can drop off your uh, prescription pills anytime. And as the mayor said, it is incredibly important. Um, we, we've talked to young people who have, have been addicted to, uh, to pills, and they, they tell us that they can go out uh, any day and get pills if they need them. And the, there's so many pills out there on the street we need to get pills disposed of, and everybody has pills in their medicine cabinets. So if you have pills back in your medicine cabinets, bring them to us on those two Tuesdays or bring them to the police department. Even if you don't have medication, you want to come to just talk about the issue at uh, Sida Park and at uh, Caltonback Park, we'd be glad to talk to you about it. 
Um, we just ask that you don't bring any needles, lancets, liquids, those type of things. We cannot collect those. But uh, prescription medication pills, absolutely. So um, we're looking forward to, uh, to starting that, uh, that tradition off, Mayor. Thank you. And then there's also the National Pill Take Back Day that your officers will be participating on October 28th at the Justice Center, although you said it's 24 hours a day. You know, every once in a while, if we make it an event or make it a make it a, a something to capture people's attentions, maybe it'll work. But you guys are then also participating on the 28th of October. We are. We participate in those every year. And and as you said, the, the main reason, despite the fact that you can bring them any, every day, is we, we just want people to be aware of the issue. Um, I, you know, we could go out right now, and you may know that you have medications in your, in your medicine chest, but you probably don't know how many. So we, we need to get those disposed of. And the safest way is to take them to a pill, prescription pill drop-off box. Great. Thank you. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, for those of you that, that haven't taken advantage of, of, of um, what we have available at the Justice Center, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that, um, you know, it's inside the Justice Center. It's essentially like a secure mailbox. Yeah. Um, and you do not have to interact with anybody in the Justice Center. You know, you, you park your car in the parking lot, walk in, um, you know, put the prescription drugs, deposit them in this, you know, secure mailbox like mm -hmm. uh, 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 receptacle and walk out. That's you it. Know? So Absolutely. it's as easy as that. Don't have any to, time of day. Any time seven of day or night, week. you don't have to interact with anyone at the police department. It's right there. As you walk into the lobby, you turn to your left and it's right there. You know, and it's a problem that makes us feel so helpless. It is a little empowering to at least do something to try to fight back. So, um, and if we can just remove the impediments, get people educated, give them motivated, and give them a closer place to go, it seems to me any impediments we can remove, it's a, it's a step in the right direction. So thanks, Chief, for everything you've done for Thank you. our community. Okay. Consent agenda. There are two items on the consent agenda. Do uh, does anyone on council wish to remove either of those two? Uh, meet the approval of two of the meeting minutes. Hearing uh, no such request, I make a motion that we approve the two items on the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. And uh, Mr. Lechleiter. Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner. Yes. Mr. Keenan. Yes. Mayor Peterson. Yes. Sam Rose Grooms. Yes. Okay, second reading public hearing on ordinances, ordinance 64-17. Authorizing the city manager to enter into a health services contract for 2018 with Franklin County Public Health. Dana. Uh, good evening. Thank you, members of council. Uh, no change from its introduction last time. I think there was some information requested, which I believe we provided. I also want to take this opportunity to introduce um, Health Commissioner uh, Joe Mazzola. Uh, Commissioner, if you want to come forward to the other, to the microphone over there. Uh, Joe is a, a recently appointed health commissioner for Franklin County. I think this might be your first opportunity to, to see him live. I thought it'd be a great opportunity for him to come forward and introduce himself on behalf of our, our great uh, Franklin County Public Health Department. And uh, you get to see him and put a, a face to the name. And commissioner, if there's anything you'd like to add uh, regarding this agreement, uh, certainly feel free to do that. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel and uh, members of council and mayor. Really appreciate the opportunity to join you this evening. I did want to just, if I could just comment on Surely. your earlier presentation. Um, wasn't expecting that, and I and just wanted to uh, compliment and uh, commend the city of Dublin for taking those steps and those, that, that concept of Take Back Tuesdays. Frank County Public Health is genuinely committed to this issue of uh, this, uh, this opiate crisis that we're facing in Franklin County. We're a member of the steering committee uh, that was, that's been convened by the Franklin Board Commissioner's Office as well as Mayor Ginther's office, and as, as part of the new community action plan that was uh, released back in June, one of the strategies that's in there is these take back events. Um, so we're right in line with where we are as a community, and, and certainly if there's anything that we can do to support your efforts here in, in the city of Dublin related to the, the issue of opiates and, and, the, and the heroin crisis, we would more than, uh, be, be more than welcome to, to do that. So thank you for that presentation. Um, as, as uh, Mr. McDaniel mentioned, my name is Joe Mazzola. I was recently appointed as health commissioner back in January. Uh, Susan Tilgner, who served as health commissioner for 17 years, retired. Um, and it's been my honor to, to kind of you know, continue in this role. Um, I spent uh, two years now at the <coughs> health department. Uh, before that, seven years at the state health department. Um, and it is a, really a wonderful place to work. Uh, we certainly appreciate the partnership with the city of Dublin to provide public health services for your community. Uh, we uh, truly appreciate that partnership. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, but what we're, uh, what we're looking at uh, for 2018 
is really kind of a, a long-term vision of where we're headed for public health. Uh, we, have, over the last several years, have kind of gone through a journey of becoming a nationally accredited health department. Could not have done so without the, without the support of our, of our local communities. We've achieved accreditation um, back, back in 2016, and now we're looking forward uh, to really uh, looking about how we can continue to evolve and, and really uh, provide public health services for Franklin County in, in the most comprehensive way. Part of that is looking at how we deliver our services, and there's a, a national conversation happening in public health right now about how, how local government, local public health government agencies should be the conveners of public health discussions and should be able to use and embrace data and align our strategies with our clinical partners. And so what we're focused on now is, how, is realizing how to do that. Uh, we're going to be putting in place a, a strategic plan for 2018, um, and we're going to be uh, working with our community partners to do that. Part of the, the um, handout that I provided for you this evening was not just an overview of all of the services that we provide the citizens of Dublin um, and, and all of Franklin County, but also a uh, kind of a summary of a community health forum that we, con that we conducted over the summer. Uh, we conducted five community forums as part of our latest community health assessment, and the one that we, ha the that we hosted in Northwest uh, Franklin County was at the Ohio University campus. And you'll see there a summary of what our community, what this community told us about what, what are the health priorities for them and some of the strategies that they would recommend that we do to take that. So we, we're, we're taking all this information as part of our community health assessment, and that's really going to drive where we're headed as far as a community and a, as a public health agency. So uh, we want to make sure that we are listening to, to the residents of our community and also to, uh, to our community leaders. So as, our, as that process unfolds of, of the new community health assessment, that will, that will uh, kind of lean into a, a community health improvement plan and then, as I mentioned, a strategic plan. So it's a busy time for us uh, as an agency. Uh, it's kind of a time for transition and, and sort of transformation as we continue to evolve to make sure that we're providing public health services uh, to the best of our ability. So with that, I don't want to make, take up any more of your time, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have about our 2018 contract. Thank you. Commissioner, any questions from Council? Yep. Keep up the good well, work. congratulations yeah. on your new position. Thanks yeah. for uh, everything that you're doing for our community. Anything else, Dan? John? Your father didn't grow up in North Columbus, did he, by any chance? Missoula? No, sir. Um, through, I'm through? from Northeast Ohio originally. Okay. But uh, as I like to say when folks ask me that, there are a lot of Missoulas running around. <laughs> okay. Um, both he was in, in Central government. Ohio and Northeast Ohio. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so. hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for thank coming you. in. Uh, Ann? Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Amaros Grooms? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Ordinance 65-17, Ann? Amending the annual appropriations for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2017. David? Ordinance 65-17 would amend the 2017 appropriations. There are no changes from the first reading on September 25th. I am more than happy to answer any questions, and staff would uh, recommend approval of this ordinance. Questions from council? I had all mine answered at the first reading, but thank you. Here we go. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Ann? Uh, Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Sam Rose Grooms? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ordinance 66 17. Appropriating a 0 0.2336 acre fee simple. Right of way in a 0 0.0141 acre temporary construction easement from Brian Cunningham and Corinne Cunningham, located 7515 Plain City Road, for the public purpose of constructing roadway improvements. Dana? <clears throat> Again, members of council, uh, really no change from its introduction. This has to do with the um, proposed roundabout at State Route 161 Post Road and Cosgray Road. Staff recommends approval. Questions from council? Ann? Uh, Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Amaros Grooms? Yes. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Ms. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ordinance 67 17. Authorizing the city manager to execute necessary conveyance documents to acquire a 0.023 acre more or less temporary easement from Robert E. Williams II, located 7608 Plain City Road, with public purpose constructing roadway improvements. Dana? This has to do with the same project uh, as the previous ordinance and uh, this has to do with the um, ongoing negotiations regarding a temporary easement. Uh, the appraisal is noted in the, um, um, in, the, in the staff report, and we have come to agreement to acquire the necessary temporary easement for $3,000, which is slightly above the appraised value, but well within the 10% overage that we typically look at. Questions from council? Dana, this is like the last one. Um, I know there's a conglomerate that is doing these acquisitions. so. Will the city of Dublin ultimately 
acquire this or are we simply acquiring it on someone else's behalf? Well, ultimately, will that, who will be the landholder for right. this and the previous application? I believe they'll be the same entity, correct? Uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, the city retains the underlying right of way to these projects um, and we are managing the project on behalf of ourselves, Union County. <clears throat> I think ODOT has some involvement as does the Franklin County engineer. But we'll, we will hold all the acquisitions we will hold. Correct. Okay, so yeah, so I knew there was a trick to that. So we'll hold it during the course of construction because we're overseeing it. After completion of construction, we'll then convene with ODOT and the county to see what the ultimate holder of that property will be. Because part of that right of way for sure is, is in the city of Dublin. Part of it's in Franklin County, part of it's in Union County in Union County and not in the township. Uh, it's in the township, but the right of way is not in the township. It's held by the county. So we'll have to reorganize that after after the construction is complete. That's kind of the reason I asked for both of these. Uh, so, but the financial agreement of participation has already been reached, That's even correct. though the ultimate holder might be subject to discussion. Correct. Okay, thank you. Tim? No, you good? Any other questions? Ann? Mr. Keenan? Yes. Sam Rouse Grooms? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Uh, Mr. Lucklider? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Uh, introduction first reading Ordinance 68 17. Authorize the provision of certain incentives to Pepper Construction Company of Ohio LLC to induce it to lease a facility to retain and expand an office and its associated operations and workforce all within the city, authorizing execution of an economic development agreement. I'll reduce it. Thanks, Tim. Colleen? Good evening. Uh, we've been working with Pepper Construction Company of Ohio. It is their main Ohio office uh, on a retention and expansion project. They're in 9,500 square feet now at Metro Center, and they have outgrown uh, that space, uh, and they've outgrown their 10-year lease. So we've been working with them on a new location. Uh, they have 43 employees, and they're growing uh, to 53. Uh, by 2022. So we have proposed a six-year 10% performance incentive on payroll withholdings, and that is tied to a new 10-year lease on a new facility that will be 20,000 square feet at a minimum. And I can answer any questions tonight, and uh, representatives from the company will be here uh, at second reading. Questions from council? I just had one question. Um, you know, we've seen, we've done these with a couple of construction companies at this point. Do those 55 uh, jobs, do they represent those working uh, in the corporate office per se, or is that um, folks that might be working in the field or, you know, in different, around our community and perhaps other communities as well? Right. One of the, one of the questions that we ask on our incentive worksheet is whether or not those jobs will be physically located in Dublin or if they are a field staff. And in this case, they are all present in Dublin every day. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. We'll see you back on October the 23rd. Thanks, Colleen. Resolution 73-17. Authorizing the city manager to execute a renewal of a parking lease agreement with Dublin Community Church. I'll reduce it. Thanks, Tim. Donna. Good evening, members of council. Before you is resolution number 7217, renewing the parking lot lease agreement with Dublin Community Church. This is a three-year renewal of an agreement that was originally authorized in 2011. Since that time, the parking lot has been repaired and signs are in place. The city will continue to lease the 30 spaces and continue to provide reimbursement for snow removal expense. Um, with that, I uh, recommend that we uh, move forward with Resolution 7217. 7317. 7317. Pardon me. Uh, questions from no, council? So I have a couple questions. Um, how many parking spots might be available? Um, by the church, how many would they be willing to lease out? Yeah, in, as we uh, reviewed the terms of this agreement, 30 spaces was all that they were, were willing to lease. Uh, because it's a, that's a really uh, wonderful opportunity that they lend to the city, um, and that is a very reasonable um, agreement to enter. Um, there's, there's nothing else in their area, and I, I read in the memo that uh, they're only usable until 5.30 p.m. Correct. 
And is there any movement of being able to perhaps use those spaces later into the evening? I tried to extend the terms of the agreement in terms of what the, the hours of use. I also tried to get more spaces, and the, the church was not agreeable to um, opening those up for us at this time. And they weren't willing to more, look more than three years into the future either? This was the best well, we could do. <laughs> that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, service for them to extend to us, so I certainly yes. do appreciate it. Any other questions? Yeah. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Amaros Grooms? Yes. And Mr. Lucklider? Yes. Uh, and under the other portion of our agenda, the Killed in Action Memorial nomination of an adding um, Lieutenant George Seeds. Matt? Yeah, thank you. Good evening, members of council. Um, in your package, you have a little bit of information on this. Um, it's somewhat of a mystery, and just to summarize a little bit for you, uh, in 2013, um, a research company known as the National Information Company conducted um, some research on the existing uh, grave sites and, and uh, veterans that are in the Dublin uh, Cemetery. And during their research, um, you know, we have two brothers that were killed in action that are buried in the cemetery, both Robert C. Seeds and George L. Seeds. It's a misfortune for the Seeds family that two of their three brothers were killed in action. Uh, Robert Seed's name is uh, currently on the KIA memorial, however, George L. Seed's is not. At the request of family, who we have some members here tonight, um, they requested us to revisit this, and um, we, we conducted some research. Uh, Alex Rosansky did a wonderful job, a thorough job of researching this to determine the eligibility of both of the brothers, and we found nothing to be inconsistent between the two. Uh, since Robert C. Seeds um, is already listed on the memorial, staff recommends that George L. Seeds' name also be included on the memorial in accordance with Section 4 of the inclusion policy. So with that, I'll certainly ask, uh, entertain any questions, and if the family is here for any questions as well. Amy and Troy, you want to come up? As unfortunate of an oversight as it was, we're glad to finally correct it now. Is there anything you want to share with us? Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm Amy Seeds, and I'm, um, I would be George's niece. And then this is Troy yes. and Todd and Terry are over there as well. Um, so they would be great nephews. Now, I don't have anything to, to add. My, uh, my dad was the sole surviving son that got sent home when Robert and George were killed within a few months of each other. So it just seems like the right thing to do to... Get his name added. Absolutely. Troy, is there anything you want to add or let her do the talk? It was really a fascinating read, uh, and I appreciate it. It would have been your father is Richard then? Um, that was a, I had flashes of saving Private Ryan when I was reading his letter of wanting to come home to be with his family because his two brothers were killed. So Some of this I knew about before, but until, um, until we did this and my sister did some research, I... I, I like I hadn't seen that letter before, so that was kind uh, of a really touching. So where where in Hilliard were they? Um, did they live at the time in the forties? Do, do you know? Yeah, no. I I grew up um, on Roberts Road. Um, right. They lived in Hilliard before that, but I, I I don't know where the address was exactly. And my in laws owned the farm right there at Roberts and Rome Hilliard. Uh, the Shrums family had grown up out there for many many years. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for, you very much. For the benefit of the students, um, I, I don't know if they can get copies of what was provided to City Council, but uh, you know this is really a very interesting story. Um, you know, it, it truly is akin to a Saving Private Ryan, um, you know, sort of moment. Um, these folks, uh, relatives, um, and, and your father, if I'm correct, um, they were all serving in World War II in Europe at the same time. Um, unfortunately, within a couple months of each other, um, two of the brothers were killed in action. And one is currently memorialized in our cemetery on our killed in action memorial. And, and what we're doing this evening is adding the other who was uh, mistakenly omitted. Um, but uh, this young lady's uh, father um, was the one, uh, you know, he was sent home. You know, if you've seen Private Ryan, you know, that, that opportunity exists, you know, the sole surviving um, you know, son that was serving 
you know, was eligible to come home and, and, and I guess ultimately did. So a lot of that history and correspondence was provided to us and, and uh, it, it's really a very interesting read. It would all be available online in our uh, records. Any of you guys have Mr. Reed? Is he your AP Gov teacher? You, you tell him that I told him you should get extra credit if you look it up and bring it into him. <laughs> but it, it's a fantastic read. Okay, any other comments from council? Okay, I make a motion that we approve the addition of George L. Seed to the KIA Memorial. I second that. Thank you, John. Ann? Uh, Ms. Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Lockleiter? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Mistake corrected. Well, uh, thank you for your family's yeah, sacrifice. Absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll communicate with them as to when that will be, <clears throat> will be engraved and added. Uh, we'll be sure to have that done, you know, before the next, well before, I would hope, the next Memorial Day um, ceremony. So... Dana, this would be a great story for a Memorial Day service uh, at, right. as we do at the Loge. I did, I did share the story with our veterans community um, just to see if they had any background or anything when we... Um, I was sitting in my office one Saturday morning when these ladies came in and kind of startled me. <laughs> Luckily, the, the door was unlocked when they came in and we were able to connect the dots. So thank you for doing that. But uh, I did check with the veterans community as well. So we'll be sure to to mention this when they do their ceremonies. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Staff comments, Dana? Yeah, I have a few items. I appreciate the opportunity. Under uh, In your last, the packet for your last council meeting I had proposed in a staff report, um, the concept of a reorganization of our Division of Community Relations uh, to be renamed as Community, Community and Public Information Division uh, to adjust the personnel data in the 2017 operating budget and to waive the competitive selection process for uh, the position of director and the position of public affairs officer. I understand there were questions uh, at the last meeting. I apologize that I could not be here, but I'm happy to try to entertain those questions if there are any tonight. Questions? Chris? Um, I just had one question. I, I think the reorganization makes uh, a lot of sense, and um, it looks like it doesn't have much impact on the bottom line. So I uh, appreciate that. And, certainly makes roles and uh, defines responsibilities. Um, I'll, my only question is, uh, is we're filling the role of Director of Community Relations um, with respect to what is our policy uh, on posting those positions as when we have department's heads and as we fill them? Well, that's a great question, and I, and I appreciate the attention brought to the importance of competitive selection. You know, I certainly support and uphold the intent of the charter relative to competitive selection processes. Uh, every employee that um, competes for an initial position with the City of Dublin is selected through a competitive selection process, so there's not anyone on your staff that hasn't at least been through that for their initial hire. Um, at times, particularly as a result of reorganization, that's not always practicable, and as the charter points out as practicable, uh, we should conduct competitive selection. Uh, however, even under such circumstances, a reorganization may, may not um, necessarily point to the need or the requirement to pursue the potential for promotion of an internal candidate. Um, and in saying that, sometimes a, an internal candidate may not quite be ready for a promotion or they may not have a good evaluation. Uh, these things we take under consideration whenever we're considering a potential internal promotion or uh, the potential for asking for the waiver of a competitive selection process. Uh, in some cases in our history, we've been able to develop our personnel with the intent of preparing them for promotion to higher levels of responsibility. I think this is certainly a case of that. Um, this is not always a given, however, and uh, they have to be prepared. They have to have a track record worthy of such an opportunity for promotion and without competitive selection. Again, you know, I want to emphasize this is not the norm. And I would point out that of my directors, uh, Donna Goss, Department of Development, Director of Department of Development, uh, was selected through a competitive process. Megan O'Callaghan, Director of Public Works. Doug McAuliffe, our Chief Information Officer, also through a competitive selection process. Homer Rogers, Director of Human Resources, through a competitive selection process. Recently, Mark Clark, our new Director of Information Technology, was um, selected as a result of a competitive selection process. Um, that's not always the case, and uh, you may recall, or some members of council may recall, 
after first taking the position of city manager um, at council's direction, I pursued a significant reorganization of the city. As a result, Matt Ehrman, our director of parks and recreation was promoted internally as a result of the waiving a competitive selection. Tracy G, our director of rec services, Chief Von Eckertsburg was reclassified. Uh, Michelle Crandall uh, was moved to, she had been, had a title of assistant city manager, but she also shared duties as a department head. And uh, now she's um, purely assistant city manager, which to me was a, a bit of a reclass relative to her responsibility. So I think city managers, in my experience with the city, and this has been an ongoing dialogue internally and with council, there is a time Certainly, I think that we try to do that in all cases on initial hire. Um, I think we always have to consider, and I, I would suggest there probably should be more dialogue about this relative to our personnel code as to what point we want to consider internal um, employees as, uh, you know, for promotional opportunities. Not that they shouldn't compete or that there wouldn't be opportunities to compete internally. Like if we are advertising a, a maintenance supervisor position will ha often have a lot of internal competition for that as well as external. Uh, sometimes we'll hold that to internal only depending on the type of candidates that we have. So I think the intent of the charter is certainly to do just what you're suggesting and I think we have a great track record of doing that. I think there are truly these anomal, uh, anomaly situations that, that lend themselves to this. Um, and again, you know, I would emphasize that in this particular case and per the memo that I submitted, it is a reorganization first um, that's resulting in the abolishment of a position and classifying that position downward to a, from a senior PIO to a PIO. At the same time, the opportunity to promote two individuals that have been working at the director and the public affairs um, officer levels for the last 10 plus months has certainly, I think, lend itself to this more anomaly situation. Uh, I'll, I'll use names because I can't really avoid that. Sue was the public affairs officer, essentially deputy director for several years prior to, becoming, prior to becoming the acting director for 10 plus months. She's readily demonstrated the ability, innovative spirit, leadership capacity, and earned the respect of fellow department division heads during her this period of in the, being in the acting role. I feel it'd be difficult, if not impossible, for someone internally and especially externally to compete with someone who's been in this role for this long. Also, as I mentioned in my memo, uh, the Director of Human Resources, the Assistant City Manager, and myself conducted a very thorough interview and a rigorous interview with Sue to validate and further assess her knowledge, skills, and abilities and fit for the position as well as assessing her vision having been in the position for 10 plus months. So my point there is we put her through the paces and I felt that if that interview process had been less than stellar, I would have sought a competitive selection process. Uh, I'm confident in her ability to perform in this role as well as Lindsay Weisenauer, whose position as senior PIO would be abolished as a result of the reorganization, but who has been operating at the PAO level as well for the last 10 plus months. So my recommendation is for all of those things, um, and I hope that you'll support that. And, I, and again, I, I want to thank you, and I appreciate it's a great question, and I appreciate the opportunity to publicly say we uphold that. I just think there are these anomalies. I think, too, as, as council has challenged me in my own evaluations about continuing, continually looking at reorganization of the city to meet the future needs of the city, as well as how do we prepare our staff from a succession planning perspective and creating the opportunity to develop and grow our own, if you will. Um, I think these are, this is an issue that we ought to take up at a later discussion because I think there is a balance between really trying to seek, provide people promotional opportunities, but to your point, making sure that we have the best talent available that's out there. Of course, I like to think we have the best talent anyway, and everyone's trying to steal our folks all the time. But, you know, with all that said, I, it's certainly a great discussion and one that we need to have. When would that conversation take place that you're talking about? Uh, actually, Homer, uh, Director uh, Rogers, our HR director, and I have been talking about, um, we're going to be bringing uh, to you uh, this, the um, analysis of the reclassification study that we've been undertaking. We haven't touched that for about 10 years. And uh, we're going to be bringing that forward to you to take a look at. We looked at our 100, I think it's 121 positions in the city and what adjustments might be needed with that internally. Uh, we'll be bringing that forward as part of the budget review process. I think we're going to talk about that or propose to talk about that in your first budget workshop because that sets the conditions relative to the rest of the budget and how you look at that. Uh, I think, too, as part of the follow-on to that, 
there needs to be some updating of our personnel code to reflect that as well as the comp plan. So that would be the place to maybe have a dialogue about any certain adjustments. I, I will tell you, I, having been with the city as long as I have, I hate to use that all the time, but it's just the fact. Um, having sat in the city manager's office and having been a director and working on hiring processes, city managers have struggled with this, you know, when do you compete it, when don't you, when does someone, I, I will tell you, I'm a product of internal promotions. I interviewed for this city uh, once to be hired, and I've been given the opportunity to be promoted five different times, uh, not counting the, uh, the position I'm in now, and you did interview me for that. Now, there are lots of examples of that within the city, and typically we bring that forward to city council when we're waiving competitive selection per the charter, which we should, but I think, too, it would be a good question to answer for future city managers to try to get that rule kind of nailed down as when is it appropriate, when isn't, and when isn't it, when is it, when isn't it, and what's in the best interest of the city as we look at providing an organization that lends itself to promotional opportunities as well, because we run the risk of losing our internal talent if we're not giving people the opportunity to grow. Um, nothing is in stone that they would get promoted, but if they have a good track record in preparing, good evaluation, what might be some of those rules around when you would consider um, um, competitive selection and when might you not? And that, that might be too hard to define, and we may not be able to figure that one out, but I think it's something that city managers have previously struggled with. I know I have, even since I've been in this position, and when is it appropriate to do that or not? Because there's this sort of loose language in the, in the charter that says as practicable, and I always interpret that as if we're doing a reorg, it's not as practicable because we're probably taking, in, in the cases that I've done since being city manager, we've significantly either removed or reduced classification, and then we've tried to move people into other positions as a result of that. So, like I said, there's any number of scenarios that can happen under, but it warrants a discussion. I, I certainly appreciate that answer. I, my, I, my intention has zero to do with personnel and 100% to do with yeah. policy. So yeah, I, appreciate I appreciate the that. thorough explanation. Um, thank you. Okay, so we'll re revisit that. Tim, did you have anything? No, I was just yeah. going to say congratulations to Sue. Yeah, we couldn't probably have anybody better handling that job. All right, so I'm going to try to wrestle this motion to the ground. Can I do it as all one big giant motion? <laughs> All right, I make a motion that we adopt the new title for the division, Communications and Public Information. One, two, adjust the personnel data in the 2017 operating budget, and three, waive the competitive selection process for A, the Director of Communications and Public Information, and B, the Public Affairs Officer. By acknowledging that the city manager has conducted a competitive selection process to the extent practicable under the circumstances, as was outlined in the memo, is there a second? I will second. Yeah. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Amaros Grooms? Yes. Okay, uh, just a housekeeping matter. I'm going to be requesting a special meeting at our, is this next Monday, Dana? Correct, yes. You have a uh, council work session uh, next Monday, October 16th. That's scheduled to start at 6 couple topics. We sent uh, information out to you in your packet about that meeting and the topics to be included. I'd like to request for a special meeting of City Council. Um, you could start that at 5.30 or do it afterwards or start at 6. Borrow some of the workshop time, however you want to do it. I need about 30 minutes uh, to discuss uh, land acquisition matters in executive session. Why don't we schedule for 5.30 and if something arises where the people come from downtown, we can push it back if okay. necessary. But that's great. I appreciate that's that. That's probably the will of the group, so that will be scheduled. Uh, Council committee reports. Amy stepped out. She was not feeling well. Uh, administrative committee, Mike. Just that we have some uh, P&Z candidate interviews scheduled on Wednesday, November 1st at 6 p.m., so put that on your schedules. Thank you, Mike. Uh, community development, John. Nothing. Thank you. Finance committee, Mike. We have um, the date set for a committee review of hotel motel tax grant applications is Monday, November 27th at 6 p.m. So look forward to that. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Morpsy, Tim. I believe we have a meeting scheduled for this Friday. Uh, how about Logan Union Champaign County Regional Planning Commission? Nothing. U.S. 33 Innovation Quarter? Uh, nothing to report. Thanks, Tim. Uh, John, Dublin Arts Council. Got to remind everybody that there's a wonderful street festival coming up, and you should all be there. 
It's the uh, now annual Bread Festi Festival. It's October 21st. There's going to be all kinds of international entertainment, great street food, all kinds of odes to the food known as bread, both in its liquid form called beer and its dry form that we're all familiar with at Whole Foods. So make it a point to be there. Thank you. Did you say the date? Did you say the October 21st. October 21st. Saturday. Thanks. Thanks. Be there. Have a great time. Uh, Board of Education. Chris? Our next meeting uh, is October the 25th, according to my calendar. So we'll have a report following that. Washington Township. My friend, Eric Richter. Come on up here, Eric. He's been waiting patiently. Eric has been waiting patiently. Eric was with Union County. He is now the administrator for Washington Township. Welcome. Congratulations in your new position. Uh, he is the, I've known Eric for many years, and he is as top shelf as an individual as you are going to come across. So we are very fortunate, as is the Washington Township community, to have you in that position. Mayor Peterson, thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction, uh, members of council, city staff. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to just come up here and speak for just a few minutes. Uh, last week was the first full week on the job. So I have been spending quite a bit of time uh, making my rounds with the fire department and meeting township staff. Um, uh, it's it's going to be a great opportunity to be here to work with so many people I've had the opportunity to work with, um, not only professionally for a number of years, but also in my my last position as, as county administrator in Union County. Um, thrilled to be here. Uh, I really only have one thing to to report on, and it's that the Washington Township Fire Departments had their annual open houses yesterday. Uh, we had a little bit of rain, um, but overall we had a great turnout. I was able to make it to about uh, three. Um, got an opportunity to talk to a number of residents, to talk to a number of uh, people who participated in the Citizens Fire Academy, um, and actually a few city staff as well who were at the open houses. So. Um, all I have to report from the township today, I do appreciate the warm uh, introduction, and uh, I look forward to working with and continuing to work with a number of people I've gotten to know over the last few years. It is fantastic to have you down here now, Eric, in, in your history with Union Town or Union County and understanding the regional struggles and challenges that we have is going to be absolutely invaluable. So, uh, congratulations again and welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Council Roundtable. Chris? Oh, a couple things. Um, uh, Taste of Dublin was the 26th, and it was a great success. Lots of folks came, and uh, they had all sort of delicious goodies. Uh, I got to attend our Snow Go Day on the 28th and, and watch our own uh, Megan O'Callaghan win an award for uh, the way that she can operate those machines and taught all of her staff exactly how that should go. And she uh, was the award winner for her category. Um, very impressive when your boss can show you how it's done in the field. So congratulations to that, Megan. Um, had a great opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peterson, for uh, allowing me to tag along to the uh, gender equity lunch that was put on my Cardinal Health at the exchange. And it uh, was a really great meeting. I, I learned a lot of things there. And um, Cardinal Health, I, I think there were two messages they wanted everyone to know as they were leaving there. Is one is that they are committed to gender equity, that they are all in, um, and two, that, that they'll look everywhere to find the best and the brightest and uh, really believe and are committed to making sure that they have access to the finest talent in the world, not in Columbus, not in Ohio, not in the United States, but they, um, they really communicated, they searched the globe for the best and the brightest. and so. Um, Appreciate that opportunity. I want to remind everyone tomorrow night uh, there is candidate night put on by the chamber in the Dublin Women's Philanthropic Club, uh, IGS Energy, um, to uh, hear all about the issues in the upcoming election. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Mike? Nothing. Tim? John? Nothing. Thank you. You know, just real quickly about the, the Gender um, Equality Summit. You know, a lot of times I sort of get, as, as I playing with my pill bottles here. It's sort of tone deaf to some of these issues, but when you sat and listened to the experts talk about gender equality, I mean, this is a today real world problem. I mean, this this is a really a, a problem that we need to be committed to. And, and I, I, they did give me the opportunity to address the group, and I said then, I truly believe some of the smartest men I know are women, so um, <laughs> we need to make sure that we stay committed to that idea because 
helps all of us. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Eric, you got it.